solving Laplace's equation. Before giving the example of how Laplace's equation can be used to calculate the electric potential between plates, let's lay out a general recipe that we will follow. Step one, choose a coordinate system that simplifies the math. So if your device looks like a cube or rectangles or something like that, well, Cartesian coordinates is probably the best. Cylindrical objects, choose cylindrical coordinates. Spherical objects, choose spherical coordinates. If it's anything else, I guess you got to pick what's closest and then suffer through the math. Step two, solve Laplace's equation in the homogeneous region between the plates. Now, for cases where the electric potential is a function of only one variable, like a parallel plate capacitor, it's really only varying in the direction between the plates, we can use direct integration to solve that. But more like if you have a, a curved piece of metal and your electric potential is going to vary with multiple variables, you'll solve it using separation of variables. After this, we have a general expression from our solution of the electric potential. So we will apply the boundary conditions at the edges of the homogeneous regions where we solve this. And then we can figure out the expressions for the constants in our general solution. After the electric potential is known, then the negative gradient of that gives us the electric field intensity. We then use the constitutive relation to calculate the electric flux density from the electric field intensity. Once we know the electric field intensity and the electric flux density, we really will know everything about that problem. We could calculate resistance or capacitance or anything else. And this is just a general recipe for solving Laplace's equation, not necessarily processing what happens after that to derive something meaningful. Here is our example. We have a parallel plate capacitor, although it could just as easily be a parallel plate resistor. And it's got a top plate, it has a bottom plate, and it is separated by a medium with permittivity epsilon. And notice the thickness of that medium between the plates is D. We apply a voltage to those plates. Since this is an electrostatics problem, there is no current flow between the plates, which means there's going to be an accumulation of charge on the plates. So given all this, calculate the electric potential between the plates and the electric field between the plates. We'll follow the recipe that we laid out a few minutes ago. And the first step of this is to choose a coordinate system. Well, staring at this, it looks rather cubish or rectangular-ish. So I think the Cartesian coordinate system is the best way to analyze this. Step two is to solve Laplace's equation. Well, let's state the problem. We have Laplace's equation, and we can use this for homogeneous media because there's no charge here. So we have Laplace's equation instead of Poisson's equation and it is homogeneous. So we just have the del squared V equals zero. We'll get a general solution from that, but we need boundary conditions. And so at the bottom plate, we'll let the potential be zero or ground, I guess. And at the top, we'll let the potential be V naught. So we're essentially applying voltage V naught to this parallel plate capacitor. So expanding Laplace's equation into our Cartesian coordinates, we get this. But looking at our problem, the electric potential is only going to vary in the Z direction, assuming the cross-sectional area of this is very big. We know that fringing kind of things are going to happen at the edges, but we're ignoring that. For the most part, the electric potential is just varying in this vertical direction. It's not varying in the X and Y directions, only the Z direction. So we can cross off those X and Y derivatives. We only have one independent variable left now, that's Z. So these partial derivatives can be written as an ordinary derivative. And this is the final equation that we have to solve. And that is not itself Laplace's equation, but Laplace's equation became that just due to the geometry of our problem. As promised in the recipe, 
if we only have one dimension, we can solve this by integration. And so if we integrate this twice, we end up with an electric potential that is apparently varying linearly between those plates. To figure out those constants for A and B, well, that's where we use our boundary condition. So the electric potential on the bottom plate is zero. So our equation was AZ plus B, but now Z equals zero. So the A times zero just goes to zero and we're left with B equals zero. So the B constant drops out of the solution. We have our second boundary condition. The voltage at the top of the plate is V naught. Well, we had an A Z plus B, but we just found out that B is zero and we put D in for the place of Z. And of course this has to equal V naught. When we solve for the constant A, we get a V naught over D. So altogether, our electric potential as a function of Z is V naught over D times Z. And it's important to note the solution's only valid in the region from zero to D, just between the plates. It's not valid outside of the plates. Once we know the electric potential, we can calculate the electric field intensity. That's simply the negative gradient. So it's in one dimension, so our negative gradient really just reduces to the negative Z derivative of V. And when we work through the math, we get the electric field intensity is minus V naught over D AZ. Notice there's a minus sign here. And that's because the electric fields are pointing downwards. And it's consistent with our sign convention where the electric field points from high potential to low potential. Also notice that this expression for the electric field intensity does not depend at all on the permittivity. That's an interesting conclusion. The last step in this example, we apply the constitutive relation to calculate the electric flux density from the electric field intensity. So we put in our expression for E and there's also a negative sign out here, but we multiply by epsilon and we get an equation now for the electric flux density. Given the electric field intensity and electric flux density, we're in an excellent position to calculate anything else we could possibly want to know about this example.